ಹೌದು ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಇದೊಂದು ಆಸ್ ಪೀಪಲ್ ಆರ್ ಜಾಯ್ನಿಂಗ್ ಇನ್ ಐ ಥಿಂಕ್ ವಿ ಆರ್ ರೆಡಿ ಟು ಸ್ಟಾರ್ಟ್ ದಿಸ್ ಸ್ಪೆಷಲ್ ಇವೆಂಟ್ ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ಎಲೆನ ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ಮೈ ಪ್ಲೆಷರ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಪ್ರಿವಿಲೇಜ್ ಟು ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಆಲ್ ಆಫ್ ಯು ಟು ದಿಸ್ ಸ್ಪೆಷಲ್ ಪ್ರೋಗ್ರಾಮ್ ಆನರಿಂಗ್ ದ ಲೆಗಸಿ ಆಫ್ ಲೀಡರ್ಶಿಪ್ ಆಫ್ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಒರ್ಲ್ಯಾಂಡೋ ಟೇಲರ್ ವಿ ಆಲ್ ನೋ ಹಿ ಹ್ಯಾಡ್ ಅ ಟ್ರಾನ್ಸ್ಫಾರ್ಮೇಟಿವ್ ಇಂಪ್ಯಾಕ್ಟ್ ಆನ್ ಹೈಯರ್ ಎಜುಕೇಶನ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಇನ್ ಸೋ ಮೆನಿ ಅದರ್ ಪ್ಲೇಸಸ್ ಹಿ ಎಫೆಕ್ಟೆಡ್ ಸೋ ಮೆನಿ ಲೈವ್ಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಸೊ ವರ್ ಆಲ್ ಹಿಯರ್ ಟು ಶೇರ್ ಥಾಟ್ಸ್ ಸ್ಪೆಷಲ್ ಮೋಮೆಂಟ್ಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಐ ಥಿಂಕ್ ಎವ್ರಿ ಒನ್ ಹೂಸ್ ಜಾಯ್ಡ್ ಅಸ್ ದಿಸ್ ಈವ್ನಿಂಗ್ ದೆರ್ ವಿಲ್ ಬಿ ಅ ಟೈಮ್ ಆಫ್ಟರ್ ದ ಫಾರ್ಮಲ್ ಪ್ರೆಸೆಂಟೇಷನ್ ಫಾರ್ ಇಂಡಿವಿಜುವಲ್ಸ್ ಟು ಆಲ್ಸೋ ಕಾಮೆಂಟ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಶೇರ್ ದೇರ್ ರಿಫ್ಲೆಕ್ಷನ್ಸ್ ಸೊ ದಟ್ಸ್ ಹೌ ದ ಪ್ರೋಗ್ರಾಮ್ ವಿಲ್ ಗೋ ದ ಫಸ್ಟ್ ಫಿಫ್ಟಿ ಮಿನಿಟ್ಸ್ ಪ್ರೆಸೆಂಟೇಷನ್ಸ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಇನ್ವೈಟೆಡ್ ಇಂಡಿವಿಜುವಲ್ಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ದೆನ್ ವಿಲ್ ಓಪನ್ ಇಟ್ ಫಾರ್ ಕಾಮೆಂಟ್ಸ್ ಸೊ ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ಫಾರ್ ಆಲ್ ಹೂ ಹವ್ ಜಾಯ್ಡ್ ಅಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ವಿತ್ ದಟ್ ಐಡ್ ಲೈಕ್ ಟು ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಆಲಿಸನ್ ಡೇವಿಸ್ ವೈಟ್ ಐಸ್ ಹೂ ವಿಲ್ ಗಿವ್ ಅಸ್ ದಿ ಲ್ಯಾಂಡ್ ಎಕ್ನಾಲೆಜ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಎರಡಾಂಡೋ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಎವ್ರಿ ಒನ್ ಟು ದಿಸ್ ಇವೆಂಟ್ ಟುಡೇ ಬಿಫೋರ್ ವಿ ಬಿಗಿನ್ ಐಡ್ ಲೈಕ್ ಟು ಜಸ್ಟ್ ಡ್ರಾಪ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಚಾಟ್ ನೇಟಿವ್ ಲ್ಯಾಂಡ್ ಡಾಟ್ ಸಿ ಎ So while I share the land acknowledgement, um, just ask you to drop in the chat where you might be um, attending this event, wherever you are in the world. Uh, let me just say, Fielding Graduate University affirms and honors our commitment to indigenous communities as the original stewards of the lands that we all inhabit. As a graduate learning community founded on the values of social and ecological justice, we recognize the deep history, critical sovereignty, expansive scholarship, and ecological knowledge of indigenous nations around the world. We honor their elders, both past and present, as well as their future generations of emerging leaders. As a global distributed learning institution, Fielding Graduate University avows the following. We commit ourselves to promoting educational opportunities in partnership with Indigenous peoples worldwide who are interested in advancing educational and professional opportunities. We commit ourselves to consulting and cooperating in good faith with Indigenous peoples through their own representative institutions in order to provide opportunities for knowledge production or any other project affecting their lands, territories, or knowledge resources. We commit ourselves to promoting and protecting the rights of Indigenous peoples by actively promoting the scholarship of Indigenous communities through Fielding University Press, to advance knowledge and provide venues for knowledge production and dissemination. We recognize and acknowledge that traditional knowledge cannot be separated from natural and cultural resources. And as such, all indigenous knowledge should be protected and respected. By centering indigenous communities, knowledge, tradition, and worldviews, we are working in partnership in order to enhance the next generation of world indigenous leadership committed to building a more just and sustainable world. Thank you. Dr. Davis White Eyes, thank you so much for that very holistic reading of the Fielding Land Acknowledgement. And thanks to all of you who've put in the chat where you are and the land in which you are also residing or sitting. Uh, I'm here in Phoenix, Arizona. We have 22 tribal nations in the state of Arizona and Maricopa are one of the historic indigenous tribes here. So I mentioned that. We will now move to welcome Dr. Katrina Rogers, president of Fielding Graduate University to bring her comments. Welcome. Hello, colleagues. It's so good to see names and faces. And it's a, it's a beautiful day for an event to honor someone that we all have loved so much and have touched our lives in so many ways. And not just us, but the lives of many people. And that's Dr. Orlando Taylor. Before I begin, I want to thank you, Dr. Dondo, and also Dr. Davis-Whiteis for a good opening and 
Uh, I think it's important always to acknowledge and honor our Indigenous colleagues as well. I also want to call out some trustees who are here today, uh, Dr. Karen Bogart, an HOD alum, a graduate of Fielding and the chair of our board of trustees, and Dr. A.G. Green, a beloved faculty member in clinical psychology, who's also a trustee, and Dr. Nicholas Smith, who is also a trustee on our board, and it's good to see you here, and our senior leaders, including our provost, Dr. Wendy Williams, and our VP for IT and Human Resources, Adino Ferrari. I want to thank you, as I said, that you're here today because there's nothing like presence and showing up to celebrate another person's life and another person's person's commitment to a community. I could say many, many things about the life and legacy of Orlando. Um, I was proud to call him friend, and he was an illustrious beacon of light for social justice, for mentorship and scholarship. And he taught me personally so much. From his time at Howard University to his tenure as my distinguished advisor to the president here at Fielding, Orlando left his mark on higher education wherever he went for over 50 years. But more than that, he left his mark on people. And if you knew him, you were better for it. And since his passing last month, I have felt an immeasurable void. And in that, I and we have lost not only a colleague, but a friend. And there's so many stories to tell about Orlando. And I know that part of what we'll do today here is to share our stories and I have a personal one that's personal to me, but it's not personal in, in the sense that I know that he also treated many people the same way. But when we first founded the DC office for fielding in Washington, and this was really Orlando's vision that fielding should have a bigger presence in our nation's capital. And he was, he was very much an advocate for that. Um, he always liked to pick me up from the airport. Didn't matter if I was coming into the regional airport in, that's close to downtown DC or Dulles way out. He loved to roll in in his car and pick me up. And then I, would, I always said, we were going on rambles with Orlando because I never knew where he would take <laughs> me. And I can see Katie smiling and I know he did the same for Brian. But I was always so touched that we took a long, long time to get to my hotel, wherever it was, because we were always going on a ride. And we he would drive, he drove this big, beautiful car and he drove it not fast. He just moved at his own pace and we would go. He'd show me Howard University. One another time he'd show me he'd show me other universities had built big, huge buildings. And he'd say, you know, Fielding could do that someday. And he just had such a big heart and he always made me smile and no matter how tired I was when I landed by the time I got to my hotel I felt refreshed and ready to go for for whatever work lay ahead in DC and so whenever I think of Orlando I think of rambles with Orlando so today and I hope for years to come we will honor Orlando's legacy and many of us vow to continue his work through the Center for the Advancement of STEM Leadership and some of you here today, I know, work, have worked with Orlando through the Marie Fielder Center for Democracy, Leadership, and Education. And I think this is an opportune time to share that Dr. Katie McGraw, who is with us today, um, Orlando's dear colleague and mentee, and also our Associate Provost for Research, Extramural Funding, and Faculty Development, will serve as the director of the Marie Fielder Center that Orlando started for us here at Fielding. And we plan to honor him at Fielding's 50th celebration in Washington, DC on May 2nd. And I hope to see many of you there. You know, there'll never truly be another Orlando, yet I think he spent his life and his work making sure that there were many Orlandos who aim to always do better for each other and for society. And while we greatly miss his presence and his laughter and his support, his unwavering commitment to improve the lives of others and to mentor and to be, to be an advocate for us, we carry on with the spirit of his memory and his passion for higher education, his belief that education empowers people, advances people, and really helps society be better. 
And I look forward to hearing all the stories we'll hear about Orlando today. And now I'd like to invite our trustee and the daughter of Marie Fielder, Nicola Smith, to talk a little more about Orlando and the genesis of the Marie Fielder Center for Democracy, Leadership and Education. Thank you everyone and welcome again. Thank you, President Rogers. And let me say thank you to all of you who are here today. Uh, I feel strengthened uh, by being in this community. I especially want to call out members of the Marie Fielder Center and of the Fielding Board, but then I want to know the friends who are making this such a gathering, uh, such a support, uh, given the incalculable loss that we have had, that the fielding community has had uh, in the passing of Dr. Orlando Taylor. Now, I'm honored to be here with you, with us, to celebrate and remember our dear colleague, the impact that he made and the gift that he was to us. Now, my charge is to recall the genesis of the Marie Fielder Center. And I do wish to say uh, some things about that, some of which I hope will cause you to smile. But before I do so, I want to say I thought about these remarks. And I said to myself, uh, what do I want to recall? Uh, just as uh, a, a kind of a, either a, a signal or just as a, a kind of a, a recollection uh, in terms of all that Orlando has been uh, to us. And in doing that, I thought about all of Orlando's deeds, his accomplishments, the exemplar that he was of change agentry. And I reminded myself, as our president has, has said, uh, others are eager to speak to those milestones and they're as eager as I am to hear them. So I'll desist on, on that part of uh, my observations, but there is one thing I did want to say, uh, perhaps because it's something that we all knew and we all experienced, and that is Orlando Taylor was a beautiful man in character, in vision, in insight, in drive, in spirit, Yes, he was take no prisoners when there was something that needed to be accomplished or that he wanted to see done, but he was always a pleasure. He was a delight. He was fun. And in this respect, as Katrina, you said, his being was a beacon. He was a lighthouse. And even in his loss, the light he shed was so great that for me, that light is still shining and it'll always shine. Now, something on the genesis of the Marie Fielder Center. As I said, I promised you a smile on, on this because I had no notion there was going to be a Marie Fielder Center. But we were at a summer session and Katrina saw me and pulled me aside and said, Nicola, Nicola, we have a wonderful man who's coming to us here at Fielding, and he wants to inaugurate a center, a center for democracy, leadership, community uh, education, and it will be named after Marie Fielder, your mother, uh, who was one of the founding family of, of Fielding. Well, when I met Orlando, he introduced me to mother. He said, well, then, did you know da 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 And of course, she's well known for da 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 And I was hearing about a person who I had some sense of, but I did not know that the things were in the public dialogue, in the public space, to the extent that Orlando had me appreciate them. I will always be indebted to him for that and for to Katrina for bringing him to Fielding and allowing us to share uh, in his excellence uh, in that manner. Uh, but I have to add it was Orlando that no recognition was made of the fact that he was the inspiration behind the center. 
meaning Katrina tried. I tried from time to time, but he was uninterested in accolades. He didn't care about the credits and the plaudits. He just wanted to see good things done. Uh, to see contributions and accomplishments that might grow out of our having such a vase. That focus on what matters, regardless of self, was part of what made him so dear to all of us. Now, I I don't want to go on. I know our time limits, and I do so look forward to hearing from those on the call. But I did want to end these observations, the remarks I've made, by thanking Orlando's family. I want them to know how much we appreciate the time we had with him, the time that they sacrificed with him. Uh, in order that we could benefit, Th that they sacrificed in order that he could be the public personage that he was, and it, supporting his making the difference that he's made uh, to all of us. So I thank you. I look forward to the uh, re remarks to come, and I appreciate you for hearing this tribute. Uh, that I'm making now to a very beloved colleague. Thanks. Thank you, Nicola. And as we transition to our next speaker, I do want to make an observation about Nicola's comments because I'm a member of the advisory council of the Marie Fielder Center for Social Justice. All I can say is when Dr. Taylor got this underway and he invited and he said, I want you, but you know, when he invites you, you know that you're obligated. So I was with joy. It was with joy though that I I signed on and I feel like it, it the contribution to fielding and to have that presence of the Marie Fielder Center and what it represents and the annual medals to very distinguished yes. people certainly lifted the center and lifted fielding. So Nicola, thank you so much for bringing all of that into the history of the Marie Fielder Center Thank at Fielding. You, Pat. Thank you yeah. for introducing that additional thread in the tapestry. So, so very true. And I look forward to Jenny, who's also has more to add on that. Thank you. Well, with that, I'll pass this back to Elena, I believe, uh, unless Dr. McClintock will, be, I know he's joined us. I know he's um, in the room, but I think Elena, you're going to bring his remarks. Thank you, Dr. Ardondo. And yes, uh, welcome, uh, welcome, Dr. McClintock. And it's such an honor to read these remarks on behalf of our Dean Emeritus and Director of the Institute for Social Innovation, a longtime faculty and friend of Dr. Orlando Taylor, and among many other things. Uh, thank you, Dr. McClintock, for letting me read your remarks uh, on your behalf. Uh, about Dr. Taylor. Let me start by describing how I helped Orlando decide to come to Fielding. <laughs> when I was Dean, we needed to conduct a program review as part of our WASC accreditation. I had seen Orlando make a presentation on the role of graduate education in promoting diversity and the broader social good. And because of his prestige, thought he was perfect fit to be Fielding's external reviewer and raise Fielding's profile as a result. I contacted him and we agreed to meet in Baltimore where Fielding was having a research session. I was accompanied by then associate deans, Judy Stevens Long, Dorothy Gupta, and Katrina Rogers. Orlando was completely intrigued by Fielding's learning model. And it didn't hurt to have three dynamic women leaders to answer his questions. After that dinner, he and I talked regularly about our families, the state of graduate education, and about the idea of moving from Big Pond, in my case, Cornell University, in his Howard University, to smaller pond like Fielding. I convinced him he wouldn't regret giving up tenure and leadership role at Howard as I had done at Cornell. 
A few years later, Orlando decided to leave from his big pond and eventually landed at Fielding as vice president of strategic initiatives and research. Orlando and I became friends and collaborated on conference presentations, publications, and grant work together over the next 12 years. We all have been rewarded and blessed with his extraordinary leadership ever since. What made Orlando Taylor an exceptional leader? First, he knew the academic territory and had many positions within it. He had titles as assistant, associate, and full professor with tenure and appointments at Howard University, University at Pittsburgh, University of the District of Columbia, and Indiana University. He knew about what it takes to climb the academic ladder, and more importantly, about the diversity of university settings, which informed his academic leadership. He held more positions of influence on advisory committees, board of directors, and associations than I have time to list here. <laughs> but just to name a few, he served as the first African-American president of the National Communication Association, the field in which he earned his PhD from the University of Michigan. He was the board chair of the National Council of Graduate Schools, which is where I first heard him speak and saw a perfect fit with, fit with Fielding and was a leader on various regional graduate school associations. Finally, and perhaps most significantly, his stature and influence was acknowledged by being the recipient of seven honorary degrees. Mm -hmm. Second, he was a mentor to countless graduate students, professors, and other professionals. Just try to speak with him at a professional meeting, as I often did over the years, and you'll be constantly interrupted by acolytes who stop to say hello. And, of course, he says hello back and remembers something unique about each person. His social intelligence was unmatched. Third, Orlando was an entrepreneur who knew the politics of applying and managing grants and contracts. He served as principal investigator on over $30 million in research, graduate tra training, and program development awards from a wide array of agencies, including the National Science Foundation, for which he brought to fielding two million, uh, two multi-million dollar grants to advance leadership that broadens participation in STEM fields at historically black colleges and universities. He also earned support from Ford Foundation, Rockefeller Foundation, and the Pew Charitable Trust, to name a few. Most of these projects involved race, ethnicity, and gender in one way or another, making his lifelong commitment to diversity. And finally, and maybe more than anything else, Orlando was inspirational. He filled the room with his laughter, command of facts and statistics. And by the way, he, he taught statistics at the earliest stage in his career, which uh, many of you wouldn't have guessed. And his capacity to connect with, um, personally with every person he met. Orlando Taylor was a gentleman a person of integrity, honor, and someone to admire and emulate. We would all do well to live up to Orlando's example as a leader, an entrepreneur, and a compassionate and creative human being. I feel very lucky to count him as a colleague and a friend. We all are lucky to have been in his presence. Thank you, Charles. Thank you, Elena, for reading this wonderful tribute that Charles shared about Dr. Taylor and all of the many, many accomplishments, but also, the, you know, this is all the legacy that he's left us in so many places. I'd like to now invite Dr. Katie McGraw to bring her reflections and her comments. Katie? Thank you. Um, it's just so important and moving for me to be here today to um, share this occasion in this space with you. Um, 
Orlando Taylor was an important pe person to many. Um, and I can say for nearly 30 years, he was a mentor to me. Um, when I started work at Howard University's graduate school, where Orlando served as dean, he immediately saw something in me that I hadn't seen in myself. <laughs> and for those of you who know him, um, you can imagine that when he insisted very gently that I should pursue a doctorate, um, that was going to be a persistent insistence until uh, until I actually followed through. Um, and it was that that very caring, gentle, but again, persistent uh, insistence that changed the course of my professional journey. And I will be forever grateful for the encouragement, the sponsorship, the cheerleading throughout my career. Um, but at the same time, Orlando's influence and the reason that we're um, that that he's so important to many of us extended far beyond this personal impact of mentorship and friendship to me. Um, as many others have said, Orlando really dedicated his career to advancing graduate education and academic leadership, and particularly for those who had been marginalized and underrepresented in higher education. And it was this work that was transformative, both for individuals' lives, but also for society as a whole. On the personal level over the years, I saw and heard his pride in the achievements and accomplishments of the many, many people who considered him a mentor, um, very, very many of them women. As Charles's remarks laid out across his career, he secured those millions of dollars in grant support from the federal government and foundations uh, to further his mission, including the Center for the Advancement of STEM Leadership, um, and the Plus Me grant, which does focus particularly on supporting women of color in STEM. Fielding, of course, will continue its role as a key partner in the important work in these grants that, uh, that Orlando brought to us. And as Nicola has related, of course, Orlando also created the Marie Fielder Center for Democracy, Leadership, and Education, both to ensure that that important role of Dr. Marie Fielder was honored, but also to create a space for scholarship and advocacy on the issues that he cared so much about. And true to his character and his spirit, Orlando created a Fielder Fellows Program as an integral part of the center with the purpose of mentoring and supporting Fielding students. Several cohorts of students have been named fellows and have undertaken research and advocacy projects of their choosing related to the center's mission. So today, as I take on the role of director of the center, um, I am deeply honored and humbled to carry on this part of his legacy, but to continue working with the Fielder Fellows as they carry forward his vision of empowerment and advocacy. And I look forward uh, to some of our next speakers uh, coming up who will be some of those Fielder Fellows and um, really will um, help us to grasp further this profound impact of his involvement. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Uh, I do want to punctuate something that Katie said, and congratulations, Katie, to being named the director. I've known her for a long time, so I, I don't call her Dr. McGraw generally, but it's just a joy to continue to be in your company, Katie, and of those so many here. But when uh, Dr. Taylor brought the NSF grant, um, this funded for four years. This was a uh, four-year grant for uh, academic women, the STEM Women of Color grant, as we called it. Uh, 64 women went through the program. So there were four cohorts of women who benefited from this very powerful program, women who were at HBCUs and then tribal colleges. So there was, again, another impact that Orlando made on the lives of women. And I think many of you know that he was also designated an honorary woman at one of the uh, conferences because of his commitment and follow through. I think so many women benefited for that. So I had the um, privilege of being a co-PI on, on the grant with Orlando for four years. And I see the impact it made on the lives of so many women advancing their careers. And we will now turn this program uh, to the next speaker, 
to Dr. Uh, Jenny Johnson Riley, who was a Marie Fielder fellow. And uh, I remember you from our, our meetings, Jenny. So welcome. Thank you so much, Patricia. Um, I had the privilege to work with Dr. Taylor, um, both as a Fielder Fellow and also in the um, writing of a monograph about the life and legacy of Dr. Marie Fielder. And I think that the work of a biographer is only partially about documenting a subject's life and contributions. It's also about uncovering connections among people and movements in a way that makes our collective work for social change stronger. And it also makes us feel less alone in our struggles. I hope what I have to share about my work with Dr. Taylor and the Marie Fielder Center today will highlight some of those connections. I first met Dr. Taylor at a fielding national session in Chicago. Dr. Taylor had recently joined the fielding community. And during a morning community meeting, he offered to talk with students about how to seek funding for their research a topic, as many have mentioned, on which he was well-versed. As a graduate student with an ambitious research agenda, I jumped at the chance to talk to him, and much to my surprise, and my continued surprise, I was the only one to do so that morning. The 15-minute conversation that followed laid the groundwork for the work Dr. Taylor and I did together over the next several years. A few months later, Dr. Taylor announced a call for applications for Dr. O'Fellows for the newly formed Marie Fielder Center. I decided to apply and became a member of the inaugural cohort of Marie Fielder Fellows. One of the things I treasure most about my time as a Fielder Fellow is the relationships I formed with students from other fielding programs. And with the Fielder Fellows program, my path would never have crossed with theirs and my research and life would not be as rich. And we're going to hear from two of my um, fellow Fielder Fellows, Greg Williams and Susan Eddington, a little bit later. As my tenure as a Fielder Fellow drew to a close and I completed my PhD in human development, um, I was offered the opportunity to author a monograph on the life of Dr. Fielder, who was one of Fielding's um, founders. As you've already heard from her daughter, Nicola, Marie Fielder was one of the most influential leaders in California education. And it is thanks to Dr. Taylor that we now have a monograph, which allows many more to know about her contributions. I want to share a brief personal story about my connections to Marie Fielder that highlights the type of connections I think biographical research can uncover. Connection, connections which are also apparent in Dr. Taylor's life. One of Marie Fielder's defining contributions was her work in school desegregation. After the Brown versus Board of Education decision in 1954, schools in the South were ordered to integrate. But in other parts of the country, schools were not segregated due to legislation. Instead, schools of, in California and other parts of the country experienced de facto segregation, which resulted from extensive redlining. To address this de facto segregation, Marie Fielder introduced the concept of two-way busing, a system in which students from predominantly white communities were bused into historically African-American communities and African-American students were bused into predominantly white communities. Growing up in Las Vegas in the 1980s, I participated in a two-way busing program. And I later learned that Dr. Fielder served as a consultant to the Las Vegas School District as they developed their two-way two busing program. I am a direct beneficiary of the work of Dr. Maria Fielder and the opportunity I had to be educated in a racially integrated school continues to influence my life and the way I see my work for social change. And I only had the opportunity to learn of that influence because of Dr. Taylor and his work to create both the Marie Fielder Center and honor Dr. Fielder through this monograph. One of the themes that emerged as I completed my research um, was that Marie Fielder was a consummate networker. Several of the people I spoke with recalled how Marie Fielder just showed up at seemingly un unconnected parts of their life, and she showed up again when they came to Fielding. Dr. Taylor shared that attribute. Dr. Taylor knew everyone, and the memorials that have followed his passing are a testament to that fact. Many of the people I spoke with about Marie Fielder said that she viewed the struggle for racial justice as the struggle for many of many generations. And I think that Dr. Taylor would have agreed with that too. As we have come to say of the current moment, and especially on this anniversary of Bloody Sunday, the march continues. And the march is stronger because of Dr. Taylor's work. Thank you, Dr. Taylor, for the indelible mark you have left on my life and the fielding community. Thank you, Jenny, for those beautiful comments. What great memories you have. 
and for being the first Fielder Fellow as well. With that, we move to Dr. Epstein, uh, the movement maker, as we have her identified here. So Dr. Epstein, welcome. Thank you. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here with you all. Um, I got to know Dr. Orlando Taylor before I knew Fielding, actually a number of years before. He was a hero to the community that I live in, which is Oakland, California, and which experienced much of the racism that our previous speaker spoke of. And at the time when I got to know him, the, 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 the city began to have a school board that was more representative of the population with many African-American members of the school board. And they were concerned with the education of all children, but they were particularly concerned with some of the ways that the education of African-American children was awry. They were concerned with the fact that often African-American children would be critiqued or sometimes denigrated for the language that they brought from home. And the school board believed that the children should be supported as all children should be in the language and everything else that they brought from home, that that was their right. And so the, the Oakland School Board developed a resolution which came to be called the Ebonics Resolution. And what it said was that children's language was beautiful and wonderful, whatever language they brought from home. And at the same time, children should be taught to code switch so that they would be able to write in the language that was expected perhaps on a college application. So that was their resolution. They passed it, they started implementing it, and they called a meeting of the press to explain the resolution. They explained exactly what it was intended to do. And the next day, the national press engaged in something which their media representative called a media race riot. The country went crazy by via, via the press, claiming all sorts of ridiculous things, saying, for example, that the resolution was about forcing white teachers to speak black English. That was one of the contentions. And this, of course, for the school board members and for everyone in Oakland was quite a, uh, a surprise and uh, horrible um, to be put on the national uh, press with no way of answering back and the, even some pretty famous people who should have known better, instead of calling the school board and saying, what is this about? They went on uh, the same critique. There was one person who had the courage and the solidarity to stand up against this horrible thing that was being done to my city. And that was Orlando Taylor. He was a respected linguist. He had all the credentials that you all have mentioned, and he stood up to the press. He said, "This, what the Oakland School Board is doing is not only okay for Oakland, every district in the country should be doing it, and you need to understand why. And he explained the issues. And it began to turn things around. So some people who had said foolish things, Jesse Jackson, for example, apologized or the foolish things that they had said. And so the situation began to turn around and people began to understand what the school district actually had in mind. Orlando wrote articles, he spoke to the press, he wrote an article in diverse issues in higher education. He used all of his expertise to explain why their position was correct. And he, was, he, was, uh, he, he had so much solidarity that he organized congressional hearings and invited the Oakland School Board members to come and speak to Congress to a congressional committee about their position and why it was correct. So he is and will forever be a hero in Oakland for those stances. Thank you. Thank you very much for that example of, of the power of Orlando Taylor. Uh, Nicola, you have your hand up or you're just reacting with a positive <laughs> comment to what uh, Kitty had to say. Thank exactly. you so much. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, 
Well, I invite now uh, an alum, uh, Susan Edgington, Dr. Susan Edgington, to bring some reflections on Dr. Taylor. Dr. Edgington, are you there? I know you're on mute. Okay. okay. Thank you. Can you, I don't know if you can see me. I don't know if you can see me or hear me. And, and can, most unfortunately, you can hear, I'm in an airport and I've been stuck here you. all day. Okay. okay. So I just want to thank every, thank you for the opportunity uh, to share about my friend and a mentor, Dr. Orlando Taylor. Uh, I had the privilege of meeting him while at Fielder and he was informed about my work. Um, I had decided to focus my dissertation on issues regarding race and racism and how the media impacted those attitudes and exploring interventions um, that might have an impact on how people perceive those issues, stereotypes, and how we might possibly make a difference. Uh, Dr. Taylor, as, as so many of my colleagues have already stated, was committed to this work. And so he kind of sought me out and said, we're starting the Fielder Fellows, and I think that your work and that you would be a benefit and an asset, and I invite you to apply. I applied. I was accepted, was honored then, I'm still honored now. My dissertation was about media representations of black women and, and, and how those representations impact the well-being of black women and girls. So I explored three primetime television programs, the first time that black women had been seen in primetime programs in 35 years. And I looked at whether those representations were um, stereotypical um, based on the, the traditional stereotypes that um, black women had been portrayed in through media for the past forever, uh, or if we had made any progress. And Dr. Taylor supported me in so many ways. I ended up, I have with his encouragement and his support, made presentations to various audiences in the US, uh, uh, abroad. Um, I, I've really been able to, to reach out to a lot of audiences with the work regarding media representations and media effects. And the work has continued. Um, I had the honor of being uh, invited to participate as uh, one um, uh, uh, student uh, uh, to participate when we did the memo for Kettering, um, the Kettering Foundation uh, on race and intolerance. And that was an exciting thing because it was my first scholarly publication. So I'm just grateful for the opportunities that I had the encouragement from Orlando, Dr. Taylor, for the relationships that I've made with the many scholars who are also doing incredible work, the Fielder Fellows that came after me, those who were joined the program while I was there, those who started at the time I did. And it, it's just been my honor and privilege to continue to do that work. And I thank Dr. Taylor. I, I, because I'm in the airport, I'm so afraid that the, that the sound is gonna go off again in a minute. So I, I would prefer to not talk too much longer because I don't think my good luck is going to hold up. Um, I did share something, uh, slides, which I will add to the website that talk about the research that I've done, uh, the research that I did that Dr. Taylor supported, um, beginning with intergroup relations, um, uh, how we use media, how media impacts uh, attitudes and behavior. Um, and how what we can do to make a difference uh, in how those media representations impact individual audiences. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity. And, and I will always cherish the memory of my friend and mentor, Dr. Orlando Taylor.
Thank you so much. And also for making the effort to call in from the airport. You did it perfectly. <laughs> no, no glitches. So thank you. But you know, your comments about his mentorship certainly come through very strongly and how he was a transformer for you in terms of moving on with something that for which you had a lot of passion and were yeah. able to uh, enact that now in your yeah. career. So yeah. So well said. Well, we now move Thank to uh, an alum again, uh, Dr. Greg Williams, who's here to share some of his reflections as well. Thank you. Six years ago, I was selected as a research fellow for the Marie Fielder Center for Democracy, Leadership and Education because my doctoral studies of democracy and historically marginalized communities aligned with Marie Fielder's philosophy and objectives. My dissertation specifically examined how widespread voter fraud disinformation influences public policy. And now as a senior Murray Fielder Fellow, I've been privileged to be able to help evaluate new fellowship applications. During my time as a fellow, Dr. Taylor always praised our research projects and proudly showcased our work. He and I occasionally discussed my own research interests and he forever showed such genuine interest. Dr. Taylor also served as, a, as an advisor to a nonprofit organization college planning committee, which I chair, and my Murray Fielder colleague, Dr. Wendy Mulhauser, founded. He was an unwavering supporter of our organization. He valued the work of all his Murray Fielder fellows, and we'll always venerate him. We'll perpetually honor his legacy, and I can speak to them when I say just how much we appreciate Dr. Taylor's support. Didn't his laugh just light up any room that he was in? Dr. Taylor's amusement would just Bring a smile to your face. I reason that we all treasure that about him. Dr. Taylor and I regularly spoke on the phone and via Zoom. And one reason for this frequency was that we both hailed from East Tennessee. And he told me that I was his last personal connection to his home state. He enjoyed discussing with me Tennessee's politics and history, such as its cycle of racial justice progress, from being the home to the nefarious Ku Klux Klan, to the civil and voting rights era, specifically the public school segregation Orlando experienced firsthand, and even more recent events such as the fiasco against the three state representatives dubbed by their supporters as the Tennessee Three. In the interest of democracy now, you may recall the two young black males and a white senior woman expelled for their involvement in a gun control protest on the state's house floor. They comically, almost immediately, reclaimed their positions through special elections. But this unsettling saga in Tennessee state history was then dramatized for embarrassing posterity's sake in a Saturday Night Live spoof. Naturally, Orlando exclaimed to me, Greg, please clarify for me what the heck's going on down there in Nashville. <laughs> These are the kinds of things that uh, he liked talking about, but we also shared a passion for sports and our beloved Big Orange volunteers. Orlando would appreciate my sharing my perspective with you on this, on his having gone astray from supporting our regional godsend, the Atlanta Braves. Instead, unfortunately, he adopted his relocated hometown team, the Washington Nationals, a dreaded divisional foe to boot. But I'd like to share one of my most memorable and deeply personal experiences involving Orlando, highlighting his kindness and wisdom. When my Aunt Kay became ill two years ago, he offered his support and acted as a wise and trusted friend. Because her medical care professionals were inexplicably unhurried to inform our family about her diagnosis, much less her prognosis, we were exasperated. Orlando asked me to describe her symptoms, which I did. He immediately identified her symptoms as linking to aphasia, a foreign illness to me at the time, but his diagnosis turned out to be spot on correct. Finally, my family understood my aunt's condition, but his invaluable help was only beginning. The following day, Orlando researched the medical facilities within a few hours drive of us in every direction, and then explained to me the necessary recovery steps depending on the severity of her illness and where we, where we might want to take her. He even assured me that if I wanted to take my aunt to Vanderbilt University's top-notch facilities, he'd intervene on my family's behalf and contact their director to ensure her acceptance as Orlando and he were colleagues. Now, although she passed within days, this account just underscores the character of Orlando's kind heart and incredible wisdom. Dr. Taylor's passing was a monumental loss to our, our community. 
He made remarkable contributions to society. His legacy will always inspire us. He was of great heart, wisdom, and a faithful friend. We'll never forget Dr. Orlando Taylor, who exemplified the true power of democracy, leadership, and education in how he lived his life. Thank you. Thank you, Greg, for sharing those very personal and professional memories, uh, because this is the man we all know. Um, Dr. Taylor had this persona and brought so many spe special uh, recollections to mind. And again, I just wanted to, to say when I first met him, I was at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, and he came to talk to uh, the students and the graduate school about perhaps the future faculty program, uh, which he had then already established uh, at Howard and and other places then became future faculty, uh, had future faculty programs. But I remember him walking across the campus. It was like a Pied Piper and all the graduate students were following him. And, it, you know, I, I so I went and caught up with him and, and got to know him. That was my first encounter. That was 2009. But it was just that image I still have of him and being followed by all these students who had just heard him speak and, and the way he had impacted them and inspired them as well. Uh, there are other memories. I know other people want to talk, but I do want to mention sports for one minute. We were in Los Angeles at a meeting with the Chicago School and Orlando knew that the uh, Dodgers were playing that night. So he uh, convinced someone who had access to tickets to buy, get us the three tickets so we could go to uh, Chavez Ravine to the very famous ballpark there where the Dodgers played. So uh, I wish I could find the picture of the three of us sitting there taking in the game. And, you know, it was uh, one of those times where you knew that you weren't, I, I love baseball, so it was a soulmate for me. And, and of course, taking me down to where the Nationals play as well in Washington. So he, he also, you know, all of those uh, poignant moments that many people shared, uh, you know, kind of for me, kind of in my memory, kind of also, uh, I recall more things about what we did together, such and driving in those two cars, Katrina, he had two cars. He had the, the car that was like the cleaned up car, Katie shaking her head. And then he had the other car, which was his car where he could clutter and make it the way he wanted it to be. So all of those uh, special, <laughs> special uh, examples of how he lived his life. Well, uh, I could go on and on, but I, I do know that it's now our opportunity to invite all of you who are with us today to share your thoughts uh, and recollections about Orlando. And you could do it by either some people have been putting it in the chat if you want to raise your hand and I, you know, we can unmute you. Uh, where's Elena? You can do the unmuting, right? And we can welcome your uh, comments, you know, maybe a couple minutes each uh, would be great. So uh, the floor is open uh, to share no. our recollections. Who's who's on now? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Redonta. First is uh, Dr. K. Payne if I spelled the last name correctly. Yes, you did. Thank you. Uh, thank you everyone for inviting me to this occasion. Um, um, I don't know how I got invited, but I imagine Katie had something to do with it. I am um, a retired faculty from Howard University and I knew Orlando for oh, close to 50 years. Um, I met him as a master's student, and like Katie, uh, he said to me, of course, you're going to do a doctorate, and I became his uh, graduate assistant throughout um, my doctorate, and um, re really was just, uh, uh, he was my professional and personal uh, friend, professional mentor, and uh, I, I 
can can truthfully say I owe everything that I am to Dr. Orlando Taylor. But, but I just want to share this story with you. Um, when Orlando um, moved from the department to become dean of the graduate school, um, his office he had an office in the in the department, which was full of books and you know all kinds of papers and things and and. Um, they asked me if I would go in and uh, make his office ready for the next person who was going to move in there. And um, I said, sure. And it was such a, a, an honor to do that because um, what I was able to do was to um, find all of his early writings and manuscripts and papers that he wrote um, over 50 years ago uh, at the time when he was um, in the profession of communication disorders uh, and linguistics, this was even before the Ebonics controversy that, um, um, that was spoken of before. And um, I just wanted you to know that Orlando um, in 1991 became the first African-American um, individual to receive the highest honor from the American Speech Language Hearing Association. And I just wanted to read to you, I thought I ran across this little nugget and I, I just thought it was just perfect. This is the resolution. It's a long resolution and I won't read everything, but I just wanna read you a few things that were said about him all the way back in 1991 when um, he was becoming the first African-American person to receive the highest honor of the, of the association. So this is a, re a, a resolution and I'll just read a few. Um, resolve that the honors of the association are awarded to Orlando Taylor for his scholarly contributions, which have enhanced and altered the course of the profession with regard to recognition of cultural and linguistic influences on normal communication, as well as the diagnosis and treatment of communication disorders. Uh, it goes on, um, and I'll read just one more, uh, for his establishment of the first and only PhD program in a historically back institution, which has produced more African-American PhDs, and I'm one of them, than any program in the world. And it concludes just with his, for his generosity affability, dedication, and inspiring love for the profession and humankind. And I just wanted to share that with you and just let you know, um, I'm so honored to be here tonight as one of uh, Orlando's oldest um, mentees. And uh, thank you for inviting me and allowing me to just share a bit of my memories with you. Thank you. Provost Williams. Welcome. Thank you. Well, thank you, Patricia and everybody. I um, just wanted to add my voice uh, to the space. I um, Orlando was one of my first friends at Field. And I'm going to try not to cry, to be to cry, but he was. He was such a generous human being, so gifted. He was such a matcher of innovation and magic. I truly miss him. We felt that, and we would jokingly say, but laugh really loud, because I have a loud laugh too, not as loud as Orlando's, but that we kind of felt related um, and that we could probably invite one another to each of our family barbecues. I met him for the first time last June during a conference uh, uh, supporting many of the academic leaders who do the work in STEM. And it was an honor because they were focusing on some of the mental health challenges that many uh, higher ed administrators are facing and we're facing and we're still facing that. And it was an honor to be in that space with them to talk about that through the lens of my work. It was my first time meeting Orlando. And I remember feeling so glad and also very precious with him because he was much older and I was worried about traveling and carrying, you know, disease, you know how it is uh, during COVID and all the rest. And so 
Um, but we had an opportunity to share a meal together with friends, with that group of people that sort of followed him around like an orbit of love. Um, the Pied Piper feels like an apt description. Patricia, it's the first time that I had a chance of seeing that. He wasn't walking around as much at that time, but um, folks, uh, they they were drawn to him like a light because he was a light. And so, yeah, I just wanted to add to this this beautiful gathering and con um convening of, of friends and and loved ones of Dr. Taylor, that he was so very special and and to me, and if you can imagine, I'd known him for just such a little while and and certainly did have that impact. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think the next speaker is Ann Austin. Thank you very, very much. I'm speaking to you from Michigan State University where I'm a faculty member. I wanted to share a memory and then uh, a particular appreciation on behalf of many people. Uh, my memory is that I first came to know Orlando very early in my career um, through colleagues of mine who were colleagues of him in the uh, communications, the National Communications Association. And my colleagues and I were engaged back in the 90s in one of the early studies that was funded for about five, six years to study doctoral students and the way in which they became teachers. And he was, of course, so knowledgeable in that area and so interested. And he very much, he was on our advisory board and he was such a friend of the project. He was already a very close personal and professional friend of uh, my colleagues on the project, but I had not met him before. And I knew as he interacted with us over those years in the 90s that I was really um, receiving quite a blessing of a wonderful friend and colleague, and, and we did grow to be friends. So I have that long memory, but I particularly wanted to bring to this gathering appreciation from a large and growing community called CERTL, the Center for the Integration of Research, Teaching, and Learning. Uh, CERTL was uh, founded back in the early 2000s, and its purpose uh, began with three universities and now has well over 40 universities involved. It focuses on preparing doctoral students, particularly in the STEM fields, but also in other fields, um, so that they will understand teaching and be excellent teachers as well as really excellent researchers. Uh, um, we, this, this CERTL group has grown over the years and Orlando uh, from the beginning was a great friend of CERTL. He served on our advisory board. He helped us as we, as others have said, his knowledge of grants as we wrote grants and had funding from the National Science Foundation. And over the last now over 20 years, uh, moving toward 25 of CERTL's existence, um, thousands now of doctoral students have had the opportunity through that organization, as well as other uh, aspects of his work and others' work, to really prepare as effective teachers. Um, most recently with CERTL, we have a particular project that also uh, Orlando has had quite an influence on that is preparing doctoral students to be equity-focused leaders as they move into their careers. Uh, in his, with his commitment to inclusion, to equity, and especially to preparing the next generation of faculty, he's been a wonderful friend of CERTL and of our more recent leadership development project with CERTL. So I wanted to just say thank you in the presence of so many who know and loved Orlando, because I, I know I represent several thousand doctoral students, who many of whom may not have known him personally, but who have really benefited from his vision and his knowledge and his great commitment um, to the preparation of faculty who truly care about their students, care about the education for all, and are, are really dedicated teachers. So on behalf of the CERTL community, I, I wanted to bring great appreciation to this gathering. And just to conclude, I had jotted down just a few words that could stay with me because like for each person here, Orlando has been quite an inspiration over many years. The word inspiration is there. He's a man of ideas and a vision um, and a man who could, I think, excite others as he worked with them. Generosity comes to mind. His great goodness, his intense kindness and compassion all expressed through great generosity. 
I think a persistence is somebody who just steadily works with a cheerful countenance, but with a very dedicated understanding of uh, what the goals are and the direction and the vision to proceed. Uh, I think of hope and vision and wisdom. And to conclude, I think of a friend, a wonderful colleague, a leader, and an exemplar of all of us who have known him, but many in the next generation who have benefited from all his thinking, his action, his leadership, and his teaching and mentorship. So thank you for the opportunity to share some of those. He will be missed, but I feel very much that his legacy will continue in the lives of many, many people. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anne. That was beautiful. That was beautiful. Um, I'm going to invite Dr. DiStefano, uh, former provost at Fielding Graduate University. Thank you, Patricia. Um, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to share a few words. Um, the words that came to my mind as I was thinking about Orlando were expansive and inclusive. Uh, his vision was worldwide. Um, and I think that's one of the things that he really brought to fielding and also to me to think big, not, not to think too small, um, to not be too cautious. And I think that was really um, very special about him. Yet um, his inclusivity wasn't, uh, or maybe not yet, and his inclusivity uh, was a hallmark of that um, expansiveness. He, I had gone, I graduated from Trinity College in Washington, DC, and he never failed to tell me every time he drove by Trinity <laughs> and to tell me what a good job he thought the president there was doing in changing that institution from one of privileged white women to an inclusive community that was really serving the District of Columbia and, and the African-American community in particular. So um, I, I recently posted something on Facebook, which I didn't realize would be so appropriate in this circumstance. Um, and it matches my sense that when we pass, we return to the divine. Um, we are always all part of the divine. And in particular, when we return uh, to the divine, this is true. Um, it's a quotation from Nicholas of Cusa and it's, Quote, an infinite circle whose center is everywhere and whose circumference is nowhere. And what a wonderful um, description that is of Dr. Orlando Taylor's um, modus operandi in the world and beyond. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you so much, Anne. I, I will welcome Dr. Williams back. I have see you wanted to make a few comments. Greg, do you have your, were you, your hand was up. Yeah, okay. Yes, uh, thank you. I, I just, I, I want, uh, I'd like everybody to know how pleased uh, Dr. Taylor would be if he knew that, uh, that uh, Dr. Katie McGraw was going to be uh, coming into his, his position and uh, taking the uh, Murray Fielder Center. Um, for anybody that doesn't uh, isn't familiar with uh, with Dr. McGraw's work, when I started as a Fielder uh, fellow, uh, she was working hand in hand with uh, with Orlando, and they just had such a great chemistry working together. She's absolutely brilliant, and if uh, if I was going to have one person I wanted to choose to to uh, step in and, and uh, tr uh, try to fill the shoes of, of uh, Dr. Taylor would be Dr. McGraw. Uh, anytime he wasn't around to be able to take part in our, in our uh, meetings, uh, she seamlessly took the entire, uh, the entire meeting as if he was right there with her. I mean, she's just so good. She knew everything about the Marie Fielder Center. Uh, she knows the grants. She just, there's no, there's no person in the world, I don't think it would be better to take over the Marie Fielder Center than than uh, Dr. Katie McGraw, and I'm so glad that she's going to be doing that. I just wanted to sh share that with everybody because I know I know Orlando would be so pleased to know that. Thank you very much, Greg. Well, the floor is open, and uh, we still have about, oh, I guess 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes for others to uh, 
share a reflection. Some number of you have been putting it in the chat and that's really great to keep track of that and to read those. But if it, anyone wants to uh, speak to the group, uh, someone's signing off, Joanne's signing off, but she has commented also on um, Dr. Taylor's legacy and <clears throat> contributions to her her profession, her professional uh, life at the graduate school, at the Council of Graduate Schools. So anyone ready to um, pop in? I mean, I can fill in some airtime if you'd like. like uh, um, he, I, I don't know, he was such a powerful person, but I'm Linda Liang and I've worked with uh, Orlando and Patricia for over 10 years and Katie and all these wonderful people. And it's been my privilege to have met all of them. Um, he could really balance power and humility. You know, you'd think here's this big, powerful, very articulate guy. And, and yet he was. I said he, he he was so powerful on the outside, but he had a teddy bear heart, you know. And just to share a little funny story, I was working for him at the Chicago School, and I kept trying to meet with him. Of course, everybody wanted to meet with Dr. Taylor. I mean, Dr. Taylor was the most popular person around. And I would send him, I, I could see his calendar, I could see his openings. And I'd send him a meeting, he'd decline. I'd send him a meeting, he'd decline. I'd send him a meeting, he'd decline. And I was working on the grass with him. And so I, I pulled a prank. I, I looked at his calendar and I booked every meeting he had open for the week, like 15 of them or so. <laughs> and he calls me and goes, Leanne, what the heck are you doing? <laughs> he had a big chuckle over it. But I'll always remember, he, he was so intimidating to me at first because he was so gracious and articulate and powerful and brilliant. But he was underneath, he was just such a warm, loving caring person and I'll miss him. So much, Linda. Yeah, so well said. So well said. Um, while we're waiting for someone else to talk, I just wanted to observe that because of, of Orlando, we traveled a lot together because of the grants. And so we would find ourselves in Montana, um, South Dakota, uh, of course, Washington, and uh, and then South Africa, where we went a couple of times to South Africa to present on the uh, STEM Women of Color project. And some of you may have seen uh, the posting of one of the alums from the STEM Women of Color, uh, Orlando Dancing. Uh, one evening, we went to uh, to dinner at this great place that had music and dance, and uh, I think. It was like when you see your parents doing something that you don't expect them to do. So I remember all of the alum, I mean, all of the um, women from the program that were there, they were just astounded. So that video stays uh, in my mind because I was there, but I, I joined the line. I thought, oh, well, gosh, if Orlando can dance down there too, so can I. So, I mean, it was just a, a wonderful gathering, but also going to South Africa with him and the great care he took to make sure everyone knew where we were, um, you know, and, and taking us down to the um, Cape of Good Hope and, and so forth. So I, I think he just was a treasure in so many ways and traveling with him uh, and, and meeting all the people he met when we would be there were again, a part of or Orlando's aura. Uh, he never, he didn't have to announce himself, I would say to you. Everybody knew who he was when he showed up, uh, whether it was in D.C., Chicago, uh, Boston. I mean, everyone knew who Orlando was. And I, I know he had such an admiration for, for Dolores Huerta, who became one of the um, fellows, uh, the Marie Fielder uh, fellow. And he was so proud of bringing her to receive the award that January in Santa Barbara, uh, many of us were there. And um, I just always think of Orlando when I think of this quote from uh, Dolores Huerta, because for me, this sort of exemplifies him. So I'll just read it quickly. Uh, her quote is, every moment is an organizing moment. 
every person a potential activist, every minute a chance to change the world. And that's Orlando. He was always being an activist and showing us how to be activists, but also how to change the world through our energy, through our passion and through our values. That was Orlando. Um, so anyone else want to comment um, to the whole group? We're, we're still open for about 10 more minutes. Oh, Alfredo, you have your hand up. Please join us. You have to unmute. Do you have to unmute him, uh, Elena? Yeah, I'm trying to do that. Oh, uh, yeah, it's all working. Okay. Al Alfredo, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, this is Alfredo Gonzalez. <clears throat> I'm the um, retired Associate Provost and Dean for International Education at Hope College in Holland, Michigan. Mm -hmm. And we've spoken a great deal about Orlando and the many remarkable things he's done in the United States. And they are considerable. I think we've heard um, just various testimonies from faculty colleagues, from, from students, and for administrators that work with him. I don't want to also miss the, um, uh, the opportunity to acknowledge the work that he has done beyond the United States. I remember traveling with him to um, the University of Querétaro uh, in the state of Querétaro to, um, to, to Puebla where we were working to um, further the uh, STEM field uh, with Mexican universities and Canadian universities. And I will remember for a long time sitting with Orlando at one of the auditoriums in Puebla where the students were presenting their work in Spanish, in English, and in French. And he turned to me, we are really falling behind in the United States if we do not take more opportunities to hear the remarkable and intelligent ways in which the world is trying to understand science. He, um, he remains a, a friend, someone that I've probably known for about 20 years now, over 20 years, and um, someone that, that knew that because of my interest um, in diversity, that he, uh, he said to me, Alfredo, if you really want to round up your education, you need to go to Chattanooga, Tennessee to understand how it was that I got started in the work that I do. Ever the teacher, ever the mentor, forever a friend, someone that I think embodies the centrality of our democracy ideals and I think further the inspiration that we saw and need today in a world that's increasingly divided. And I think we can look to him as an exemplar of an individual who broke so many barriers. And I think, you know, created a, a beam of light for us to, to follow and to emulate. And so I'm, I'm grateful not only for his contributions, but I think it's, Others have said for the remarkable example that he is to many of us. Dear, dear friend, uh, will be missed. And um, I just want to thank you for, for the opportunity, Dr. Arredondo, for uh, allowing us to not only learn from you, but to learn together, I think, uh, a fellow that we've all of us love so dearly. Thank you. My thanks to you, Alfredo, for those very heartfelt comments. Uh, those, those are the types of observations Orlando would make. And, um, and, and he made them with such kindness, but also his, mm -hmm. his astuteness uh, of his comments uh, were always register. Just want to take it in. 
Thank you. We have about five minutes if if someone else would like to um, share a reflection, even if you've spoken before, um, any of our our fielding uh, faculty alum. Dr. Ardon, the uh, colleagues, I just wanted to briefly share uh, that we will continue the work uh, of Dr. Taylor at Fielding, and I know that Dr. Magro already has lots of wonderful plans, so uh, we will keep everybody in the loop, and our goal is really to continue to communicate with uh, colleagues both at Fielding and beyond. Uh, we will have Fielding's 50th anniversary event on May 2nd, at the Capitol Hill building, at Rayburn building, and that will be, uh, while it is a celebration of uh, fielding and our 50th anniversary, our organizing committee and the board of trustees has emphasized that this event cannot happen unless there is a significant tribute to Dr. Taylor. So our community will continue to, to recognize his work uh, both at fielding and beyond and every occasion and opportunity we have. And then we will also present announcement is coming. It's not public yet. Also, the medal that uh, Dr. Taylor envisioned with colleagues, the Murray Fielder Medal, uh, later this summer. So we'll keep you in the loop. And if you have any questions, reach out to us and uh, please continue sharing it so we can keep the archive also of Dr. Taylor's work at Fielding. You. Thank you, Elena. And I just want to ask Dr. Rogers if you would like to give the closing remarks. Still there? Mm -hmm. She might not be available, maybe. I will okay. Continue. Okay. Well, with that, then let me thank all of you because our, our memories are expansive. They are deep. And um, they're ones that I'm glad are being captured through this gathering we shared, uh, talking about this beautiful legacy, because all of us have been transformed by our, our contact with Dr. Taylor over the years. So keep those memories going. And uh, I hope this archive that Elena is mentioning will be an expansive one, because there are, it goes back, I, Dr. Payne talked about some of his writings from 50 years past and, and beyond, and I think those have to all be part of a, a new archive at Fielding Graduate University. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. It was you. my pleasure you, to be Patricia. here and my privilege to be here. Yeah. Thank bye, you, everyone. Elena. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, Elena. Thank you. Thank